This is part one of how to make a coal-fired steam engine boiler plant, getting all the parts together and thinking about the design. The other day I was looking at this boiler that I've had for quite a while. It's called a Kingdon boiler. If you want to know more about that, there may be some information on Google that's worth looking at. The design is different. I'm not quite sure how it gets that name. The top bit is thicker than the bottom bit, and this is possibly something to do with the lower centre of gravity in a steamboat, because I do think this type of boiler is more popular in steam launchers. I'm just removing the fittings. The fittings have been in this boiler for quite a while. I'm going to put them in the normal green pot to keep them safe and out of the way, and I think with these fittings I will take the paint off them. Black fittings are okay in some instances, but this will look much better with polished brass fittings. This one's a bit tight, but luckily I have my trusty Barco spanner at hand, which will make short work of removing this fitting. I've been wanting to do this job for some time. I've kept looking at the boiler sat on the shelf and thinking, I must really get round to doing this, so now's the time. And of course, it's going to be a coal-fired boiler. I much prefer coal-fired boilers because they generate a lot more heat and therefore more steam. As well as the hand pump, I'm going to fit a steam-powered duplex pump to this because I have one that's currently for sale but I'm going to withdraw it and use it in this steam plant. Thinking about the design, I need to make an ash pan that sits at the bottom of the boiler and supports the boiler as well. And I need to make a top cap for the boiler. When I went up to Blackgate's Engineering the other day to buy these parts, I was very pleased to find that a sweet pea smoke box ring, that's the piece that goes at the front of the smoke box that supports the door, is a perfect fit for the top of my boiler. And the fact that it's made from gunmetal is just another bonus. Whenever I get back from Blackgate's Engineering, it's a little bit like Christmas morning. There's always something to unwrap. I wonder what this is. Aha! These are three pieces of brass. I'm going to use these to make the columns to support the boiler. And what is this? This is a large piece of steel. And I'm going to use this to make some tea nuts for my rotary table. More about this later. And it's over now to the small box for the lathe, and I'm going to start by opening the chuck jaws to try and accommodate this very large piece of cast iron. One piece of equipment that I've never owned is a faceplate. Faceplates are quite useful for machining things of this size. But alas, I'm completely devoid of a faceplate. So what I'm trying to do at the moment is clamp this very large piece of cast iron in my small three-jaw chuck without snapping the jaws off. Well, it's spinning anyway. This is my new camera mount. It's a Manfrotto-type mount, and it sits over the Boxford lathe. I also have one over the Smart and Brown lathe. This speeds up the job, and it makes it much easier because when I have the tripod right in front of me, it's very difficult to get in and actually do the job. And here's the exciting view from the camera mount that I've just shown you. One slight problem becomes apparent immediately. I'm having to reposition the tool in the tool post because it's too close to the work. So I'm moving it back a little bit, and this way I'll be able to take a sensible cut. The reason that I use two lathes in the workshop is really to save time. I cannot be doing with resetting tool positions and messing about. I have one set of tools for the larger machine and one set of tools for the small one. And this tool is still too close to the work. This is the smallest cut I can take. And bear in mind it's a small chuck holding a very large piece of cast iron. And if this cast iron falls out of the chuck, it will definitely break the tool and may do some other kind of damage. So I'm going to cut this clip short because I don't want to do that. So once again I'm slackening off the Allen grub screws in the tool post and I'm going to move the tool further back. And if you look at the cut that I've already taken on the piece of cast iron, you can see the chatter marks. Those ribbed marks around the edge are called chatter marks. And this would spoil the finish of the work, and they're quite difficult to get rid of. Often what you have to do is pull the lathe round by hand at a very slow speed and take a very fine cut to remove the chatter marks. By the way, when I'm making these videos, I have a fairly good idea what's going to happen when I take too deep a cut on a badly supported piece of metal. This is a much lighter cut, and it's cutting quite well. But really, I should be doing this in the bigger of my two lathes. 
I'd just like to show what is possible with a very small machine tool and a large piece of metal. What I'm doing here is repositioning the piece of metal in the chuck. I'm using a soft hammer, and some people may cringe at this, but it doesn't do any harm. I've never broken a chuck yet. And after I've tapped the piece of metal with the hammer to line it up a little bit better, I then tighten the chuck. I'm actually going to run into a problem with this job very shortly because I do not possess a set of outside jaws for this chuck. I have two sets of inside jaws but no outside jaws so it will be quite difficult to hold this piece of metal by the edge but luckily the other lathe will be okay for that. In any case this is cutting quite well at the moment a nice fine cut it's going to sort of use up most of my lifespan but it's going to be a good cut and a good finish. As a precaution against dying of old age in the middle of this video, because it's taking so long on the small lathe, I'm moving the piece of metal onto the larger of my two lathes. This is a Smart & Brown model 1024. And with the piece of cast iron firmly held in this four-jaw self-centering chuck, not a four-jaw independent chuck, all these jaws pulling together, and they're very useful of chucks like this, they really do hold the work very securely. The only problem with them is they are no good for hexagon. And to make doubly sure that this piece does not fall out of the chuck, I'm holding it in place with a hardwood pad pressed against the work by a live centre. And now I can take a much firmer cut. I'm using the normal round nose tool that I use for a lot of jobs. I find it particularly good for cast iron. What I'm currently aiming to do is reduce this piece of cast iron down to 5 inches in diameter to match the top part of the boiler. And while you're watching this routine piece of turning, which is nothing special, I'd just like to mention that in my previous video I put a picture of the model engineer's handbook. That was a bit of a mistake really because I got lots of comments telling me, oh there's a man on YouTube who wrote that. Um, I don't think so. It was a Mr Walshaw who wrote the model engineer's handbook and his pen name was Tubal Kane. And as far as I'm aware, he died in 1998, so I doubt if he's currently on YouTube. So hopefully, this statement finally clears it up and the comments will stop. There were so many comments saying, Oh yes, that's Pete222 or whatever his name was. I think I'm going to change my name to Isambard Kingdom Brunel, just to confuse the issue even further. Or maybe Archimedes would be a good name and then I can leap out of the bath screaming Eureka and be taken off to the asylum quietly by men in white coats. It's no good, I'm going to have to speed this video up. The only trouble with speeding it up, it looks like it's going the wrong way, but trust me, it's not. It's revolving from this angle in an anti-clockwise direction. In the next episode, I will be completing the making of this ash pan, otherwise known as the base of the boiler. But for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.